Welcome to Road Trip Roundup. This episode is Stories of Malicious Compliance. Please like and subscribe so we can continue to make more videos every day. Without further ado, our first story is written by Extreme Conditions, entitled Put That on My Personal Credit Card. Okay. In 2000, I was hired by a company in the construction industry. In 2002, they asked me to help start a new division of the company. They are the owners and the general manager. The general manager made it known he had a bug up his butt for me after my first year. Intermittent little digs, flippant attitude, demeaning, etc. Cut to after we get the new division up and running and I request being able to start a web presence, ownership is all over the endeavor while the general manager brushes me off and says, it's your division, do what you want. My division functioned with a separate business name. As I'm purchasing the domain name, my thoughts turn to the mothership and how it has zero web presence. Checked out and lined up the actual two business names and several close permutations so they would be somewhat secure and knowing their business names couldn't be taken out from under them. I go to the general manager and ask for a check from the main company to pay for the domain names and he, again, brushes me off, saying, it's your division, his favorite line, do what you want. You've got a credit card. Expense it like anything else. I did start to ask, are you sure you want me to put it on my personal? And was curtly cut off. By 2004 my division was running at a 44% profit margin which netted $750,000 a year. In the first six months of its existence, I'd already paid back the build-out, training, machines, equipment, and all the startup slash setup, that is how successful this division was. The general manager became jealous of my achievements and tried to seize control over operations citing he was the general manager of the entire company whereas prior, it was my division to do what I wanted. Each horn and by him, I'd deflect and defend my division. By 2005 I'd had enough and ended up quitting as I heard he was preparing to fire me to fully seize the shiny penny as his own and take all the credit. I plan ahead, saved money, quit, and took six months off. It was a spring-to-fall extravaganza of doing whatever the heck I chose. Good times. Good frickin' times. About a year later, I can't remember exactly how long, a charge appeared on my credit card for my former company's domain names, being for several, the amount stood out like a sore thumb. I called and verified the charge and who slash what it was for and in my conversation with a very nice person, they said, Yes, Mr. X, all of these names are registered to you. About three years after I'd left the old company, my phone rings, and guess what number pops up on the screen? Oh, yeah, I let that go to voicemail. The message was from the bookkeeper asking if I could return their call. The next day, here they try again but straight to voicemail they go. After a week of messages that were now pleading with me to call them back, I returned the bookkeeper's call. Well, the cat came out of the bag and the main company finally decided to build out a web presence and had shelled out a ton of money to do so. Think, online catalog, interactive web page, all the things we expect now, but were high-tech then and were just coming into functional reality. Lo and behold, when they went to get their beautiful.com up and functioning, their exact name was taken as well as a string of similar ones they could have used had I not snatched them up. The bookkeeper asked me to release the names to them. I indicated that would be very easy to do. It's a simple matter of signing them off, no? They agreed as their anxious web builder had prepped them for the chat with me. I said I'd be happy to turn the keys to the kingdom over to them, but I wanted a few things. Reimbursed for all expenses up until that point for owning the domain names. A finder's fee, that pissed them off, but what can I say? I was yelled at to put their domain names on my personal credit card and the general manager himself would have to hand deliver the check. That third line item was a sticking point, but dear Mr. Manager was forced to bend the knee. I mean, I certainly wasn't going to budge. The general manager shows up at the appointed place, hands me the check, and barks at me about returning their domain names to them today. He did this so loudly that people in the coffee shop we met at turned and stared. I laughed and said, after the check clears, sure, yeah. He balked and insisted I immediately transfer the names to them as I was holding up the entire show. As I left, I smiled and said, you're to blame here. He yelled at me to put the domain names on my credit card. He was absolutely fuming at this point. Besides, I love taking your advice to do what I want, remember? And I am. Our second story is written by Gloomy Ideal 3670 and is called 
Dress for the job you want, not the job you have. I work for a family business with 30-plus employees. This is a company that has friends and family members as top-tiered management and often made up rules whenever they felt like it. When new employees join the company, they sign a basic employment contract stating the compensation, benefits, and work hours. The company does not have a written code of conduct. One particular manager is a friend of the president. Let's call her Sally. Sally manages a team of eight employees, including myself. We aren't allowed to make small talk while working and we are required to let her know when we start taking our breaks and when we return from breaks. Sally interjects whenever a team member is asking another team member questions because Sally is a micromanager. Sally also makes us come to work early once a week for 30 minutes, unpaid, so that she can recap the previous week and often uses this time to tell us what we're doing wrong. She made it clear that this weekly meeting is mandatory. During one meeting, she brought up expectations for continued employment at the workplace, no swearing, no talking bad about customers amongst ourselves, no personal phones on desks, no music during work hours, no talking to other departments unless it's work-related, etc. Then she brought up the dress code. It's important to note that we've never heard of a dress code at work and our jobs do not require face-to-face -face interactions with customers. Most of our dealings are via phone or emails. We may see a customer drop by once or twice a year. Most of the team members wear hoodies slash long sleeve t-shirts with jeans or leggings. I usually wear a simple top with pants with my hair neatly blow-dried. Apparently, that's not appropriate enough. Sally said we should try to dress better and more professionally to keep up with the company's image. Her cell was dressed not for the job you have, but the job you want. She made us all sign a document citing the topic of discussion at the meeting. You want us to dress for the job we want? Okay. A few of my colleagues and I decided to maliciously comply the following day. I put my hair in a messy bun and wore my Costco leggings and my husband's old t-shirt. That was my everyday look when I was unemployed. Sally saw me when I walked through the door and asked why I was underdressed. I said you asked us to dress for the job I want. I want to go back to being a stay-at-home mom. I love staying at home. She said that's not what I meant. I met bigger aspirations and goals as she looked at me with exasperation. Shortly after, my other colleague showed up one after the other dash two wearing full workout gear and one wearing her anime costume. One guy wore a t-shirt with expletives. The president noticed and asked us if Halloween came early and we told him what Sally said. I don't know what happened but safe to say. There was no mention of any dress code since. TLDR, manager asked us to dress for the job we want, not for the job we have so I dressed as a stay-at-home mom. Our third story is written by, General Ad 1119, sticking to orders. So a few years ago I was an engineer for one of the largest bread makers in the UK. We worked as a team of four including the team leader. Our plant had three production lines with a combined output of 220 loaves a minute. Our engineering manager had just been sacked and we were given some other pointless manager, who could only manage numbers, not people. We all disliked him as he'd pushed good engineers out of the department as well as stabbing operators in the back and getting them sacked. This was his first order, engineers are not to be in the workshop unless working on something, or shift handover. Engineers are to be assigned a production line each with the spare looking after the twelve slicers and baggers. Engineers are to patrol the lines unless on break, no deviations allowed. And this is where our malicious compliance came in. Due to the large-scale manufacturing, there was a lot of heavy equipment. Some jobs could occupy all four of us for manual labor. We were also differently skilled. Some mechanical, some electrical, and me as the sole multi-skilled and software tech on our shift. The way the bread is produced, if one part of the line goes down, for example oven, then all the bread on the conveyors, proofer, and mixer has about 5 to 10 minutes before it becomes scrap. We stuck to our orders and all agreed if we saw another engineer having to deal with a job that we'd all not help. We all agreed not to bust our balls, or create unnecessary work for the ops. If a line had a mechanic but had an electrical issue it would have to wait until the next break rotation which could be 4 hours away. After one shift the efficiency of the line dropped from an average of 75% to 40 and the scrap rate went from 25 to 50 percent. The bakery lost a shit ton of money that shift. It carried on for the night shift, then the assigned areas were abolished and never spoken about again the following morning. 
Our fourth story is written by Whitewer and is called Want Us to Follow Your Script to the Letter? Not a problem. So many, many years ago, I worked for a contract company in Ohio, doing first level support for when ATT had cable internet service. Not a fancy job, but paid really well at the time. So, up on high, they decided they didn't like how we were doing our job and not following their script for every call. Normally, some of the steps didn't need to be done like we didn't need to power cycle your cable modem to make a payment, etc. So then management, in their infinite wisdom, decided it would be good to give us a new script for connection troubleshooting and told us to follow it exactly and not add, subtract, or change any steps otherwise we'd get in trouble. So, we began following it. Example for the connection issue. Unplug cable modem. Unplug network cables. Wait 30 seconds. Plug network cables back in. Check network settings if no resolution to the connection. Transfer to tier 2 support level. Now all of us on the evening shift, being nerds and tech geeks, noticed a glaring flaw with their steps. We attempted to point it out to them, but we were told not to question it and follow it exactly. So that is what we did. After 4 or 5 days of hundreds of customers being sent to T2 support just to plug in their modem and get back online, we ended up getting a memo telling us to go back to doing things the way we were before and just help the customer. It was hilarious for a few days and made our job fairly easy for troubleshooting. Have other stories from that place, but more workplace hijinks than MC. Our fifth story is written by Red Miracat and is called Change a Tire, Get a Free Truck When I was 16 my father said if I changed the tire on his old pickup I could have it. For a 16-year-old girl with no money to buy anything better than an OMG ugly truck, I had no right to complain but really didn't want to learn how to change a tire. So I called my grandfather and asked if he would add me to his AAA as he already paid for my mom's and this would be a great birthday gift. The day after the AAA card came in, I called and had the tire changed. Dad bragged he was able to get me to change the tire. I didn't clue him in until 10 plus years later and he admitted he didn't qualify how I was supposed to change it. Our sixth story is written by Famous Competition 15 and is called Child Care Revoked? Okay, good luck then. My husband is currently redoing our roof after it failed in December following a heavy frost. It's taking a long time and as a result, he's been unable to go to work or help care for our nine-month-old, as stopping water running down the walls has been the priority. Edit to add. He decided he'd build dormers once the tiles and felt were off to avoid having to strip the roof ever again. This is what has taken a long time as while he's been building the dormers, the roof has been exposed. It's been extremely difficult for me. I went to my workplace and explained the situation. They said I could bring my daughter while I was without support from my husband. I can't afford nursery on my salary, and my family lives far. I work in a museum for creative children's activities. All of January. I worked on creating a big audiobook trail and baby sensory room for February half term. I managed to install it a week early. Everyone was really happy. Then, the day before I was due to be in five days to monitor the launch week of this trail, I received an email from the CEO, who was never on site, saying I wasn't allowed to bring my daughter in anymore because it was inappropriate. I said okay, good luck finding someone to cover for me and took all my paid leave. I'm now looking for freelance work delivering workshops so I can leave, while they scramble to get someone to monitor the room. All my team have played along, and have said if you don't want a baby in the baby room, it's just not going to get staffed. They lost five staff members last week because of poor management. It's not a large team either. Our seventh story is written by Quinn the Wizard, and is called I'm Replaceable? Fine, then find someone else during a shortage. So I worked in a school district and have gone above and beyond for students and teachers in the past two years. I got into a big argument defending my coworkers and myself from being overworked as well as cattiness from certain teachers and the VP. The VP pulled me in and gaslit me saying that everything is my fault for riling up all the other staff and then said that we are all replaceable. Oh, I'm replaceable during an education shortage? After that, I decided to quit and be a substitute teacher in a few districts, including the one I left. Ever since I left it has been a shit show for them as three other people left after me and the couple of people they got to replace aren't even showing up to work. The best part is, I get to show up almost every day to sub and make more money while being good at what I do and happy. Edit, cattiness, no golf was played. Edit 2, 
I was a paraprofessional, not a teacher. Our eighth story is written by, The Lightning Count One, and is called, You Demanded My Entire Team Be at the Office for the Fourth of July. Fine, enjoy paying for the office party. So this starts on Monday, the 13th, as I receive an email from a VP, not over my department, or bad VP. I am told that my team will be required on the 4th. I politely tell them no that our team has been scheduled this day off and people already have plans. My team is the IT team and, as many of you know IT team gets shafted every time it can get shafted by any company. So over the course of the week, I let my team know what is happening. I let them know I have been reaching out to higher-ups to fix it. I also tell them that if their plans are ruined, I will make it right at work. Over the course of three meetings, it starts to look like things will not go my way. In response, I send an email to the CEO of the company. All of my higher-ups know I was going to do this and said I should do this as he is very family-oriented and that he would not allow anyone to work on a national holiday. Well, he is on vacation in the Bahamas until the 6th. But his assistant informed me he would look at this after he gets back. Repeatedly slams head into desk. So I tell everyone that it will be work from home, and that we will be setting my cell phone as priority in the call routing. Meaning I would get most of the calls. To be honest, I was expecting almost zero calls. Especially since I was asked to send out a notification that IT support would cover the 4th of July. I never sent that email out. A day later I was given another outrage. I was told in an email that my employees would be required to be at the office, and no one was allowed to work from home. They would be checking the door badges to verify we were at the office. I asked why in an email, and they said that they wanted to make sure no one was playing video games at work. We normally work from home about two-thirds of the week and video game playing is a normal occurrence at work. So I walked into the person's office. After a very long conversation where she was losing the logic war with me, she told me that it's just IT, you guys don't have lives. No, I am not kidding you, this is exactly what they told me. I reported this to my VP who said, I will take care of this. It likely won't be until after the 4th, so get creative. I know this man well. We have worked together a long time and get creative is code for corporate fuckery. I asked the person requiring us to be at the office if they cared if we had an office party. They said no, as long as it did not interfere with the call flow. Even suggested using my new company card to pay for it. Go wild. Pro tip, never tell me to go wild. At this point, it was Tuesday the 21st. I let everyone know what's up, but I have something planned. I asked who had things planned for that day. Two people told me they were planning to shoot off fireworks with their family, but the rest were planning BBQs with friends. I write up an email to the VP of my department and the bad VP. I tell them all that I let everyone know. We all were expected to work until 8 p.m. Monday. For the conversation with the bad VP, I will be having an office party as a sort of sorry to the guys and gals who got shafted by this decision. The bad VP replied again. Thank you for your understanding. Also yes I would expect an office party if I had to work on the 4th of July as well. So go wild and enjoy your time. Use your new company credit card if you need to cover a few expenses. Also, I should not have to remind you or anyone else. No fireworks or alcohol on company property. So now it is time to tell you about my office. See a while back, the IT team was moved from the main corp office and into a smaller building by itself. It has a nice gaming break room, a decent-sized gym, and a full-on drink bar. Soft drinks mind you, no alcohol at work. Out back is a big patio that crosses county lines as soon as you cross a small creek. A creek that just so happens to have a footbridge over it, leading to an empty field. I start making phone calls. Monday, June the 25th. I call up everyone into an hour early meeting that morning. I explain to them all that I will be making it right. I asked everyone to invite their friends and family to the office. No supplies will need to be brought by anyone. I tell them all that this will be non-alcoholic, but that I will be planning something for everyone. I told them to expect all food to be provided and that they don't need to bring anything, unless they want to bring some fireworks. I.e. they won't have to spend a dime. The fourth comes in the entire day, we did absolutely no work. No tickets, no calls came in. Well, seven calls did come in, but from the same person. The bad VP. 
she was calling to make sure we were manning the phones. All of us were playing video games or watching movies. 6 p.m. rolls around and everyone was told that the food was ready. People were expecting hot dogs, hamburgers, and maybe a bratwurst or two. What they got was a full-on barbecue feast with pizza and other foods. There was smoked brisket, spare ribs, smoked sausage, smoked turkey, both kinds of tater salad, coleslaw, green beans with bacon and onion, potatoes au gratin, pizza from two different places, excellent hamburgers, and bratwurst hot dogs. On the desert side was cake, very good cookies, for different kinds of pies, and about two pounds of fudge. Families and friends started showing up at around 6 6 15 ish. Some brought alcohol, but I told them they would need to leave then in their cars as I was not that crazy. Some were not too happy about that, but agreed as it was a free dinner for random strangers. So let me set the scene for you. I am out there with all calls routed to my cell phone, and everyone just having a good time. We have a TON of people there just enjoying the fun night, chatting about random stuff, eating the food, and occasionally lighting off some sparklers or throwing firecrackers into the stream. It's not stocked and only one foot deep. My VP, not the bad VP mind you, showed up with his family and brought some water balloons for the kids and man children. Around 8 colon 30 ish it's getting dark and people want to shoot off more than the simple sparklers and firecrackers we had been using. The VP over the IT department had everyone cross the footbridge, over the county line and off company property mind you, and we set up a big wooden board using it as our launch pad. We fired off what we had for an hour or two, and sort of just hang out for a little while. At around this time, people were tired and ready to head home. I told people to take home leftovers, within reason. We all clocked out at 8 and no one left until about 10.30. The bad VP did call once more while we were out back at the party. It was 7.50 and she called asking for a status update. My exact words were, Well, you were the only one to call us today. The rest of us are on the back patio enjoying the 4th of July shindig. She simply acted like my boss and said as long as no alcohol or fireworks are on company property, I do not care. We ate roughly half of the food catered. The rest was taken home. A small group volunteered to stay behind to clean up including my VP. We had a funny conversation about how this will make waves with the bosses. But he said he had my back and asked me how much this cost. I just gave him a sideways look which made him laugh. Tuesday morning, I submitted the expense report to my VP. This email would inevitably make its way over to the bad VP and up the chain to the CIO of the company. It would be a bad idea to give out the exact cost of the party, mind you but I can tell you that because of this 4th of July party, new rules were put into place. Any expenses of over 4K or more must be approved by the direct supervisor, VP over the department, and the full expense report must be sent to the financial department for review after the fact. Hint, the party cost over 6K. The barbecue was the most expensive part. I did not order from a low or mid-tier place. The place I ordered from has consistently been on the top 10 in the DFW listing for the last 30 years. I ate at that place so much that I made friends with the owner. The best barbecue I have ever had. The pies and cakes were custom made by a bakery and the cookies were made by a boutique cookie place. I had 10-12 packs of Coke, Coke Zero, DP, DP Zero, Pepsi, and Pepsi Zero. I bought 5 pepperoni, 5 sausage, 5 cheese two Hawaiian, and three cheeseburger pizzas from one place, and nearly the same number from another place. Excluding the cheeseburger ones, I subbed out those for a different specialty pizza from the other place. The burgers were from an excellent burger place that did the catering. I know that owner well. He brought his kids for the night of fun after he heard what was going to be happening. He was also the one who brought the brat dogs as he recently added those to his menu. This was the most expensive office party in the history of the company. The only things more expensive than this were some business meetings that the CEO rented private rooms and high-end restaurants for. As for the CEO, he was outraged. Not at the cost of the party, mind you. He knew that the party would not have been necessary if people had been allowed to go home. He was outraged that IT was the only group required to work on that day. When I submitted the log showing how we received no real phone calls, no service requests, and that we basically watched movies slash played video games during our shift, he had heard enough. 
he apparently sent out a scathing email about work-life balance and the importance of our holidays to every upper management. It was kind of funny as people wanted me to get in trouble for what I did, but the reality is other departments have done similar things in the past just not on the scale that IT did. The bad VP was admonished quite effectively and sent me an apology email. I forwarded it to the team with a strong hint to not reply. Then my VP let the CIO and the CEO know about what the bad VP said. You guys don't have lives. The bad VP did actually confirm she said it in a meeting with her EVP. It did not go over well. I have never heard people yelling in an office meeting like that before. The CEO of the company came to our office and yelled at her. Not sure if she was fired, but she is not at work today. In Active Directory she does not have the down arrow of death, so not 100% what happened to her. I know she lost whatever clout she had at this company with her attitude. If anything more happens, I will update. But so far it looks like the fallout from this is it caused a new rule to be put in place about how much you are allowed to spend at one time. The bad VP may or may not be let go slash forced to resign. I know she got yelled at. Strangely there is now no longer any pushback for my bid to get everyone back to working from home. Edit, please stop asking me where the restaurants are. I'm not doxing myself. Our ninth story is written by Boy in Black 13X and is called Ex-husband ghosts ex-wife, racks up a huge bill. He clearly didn't think things through. My compliance was malicious for the ex-husband. I'm working in the billing queue in a call center for one of the big three telcos and a client calls in regarding a billing concern. This lady calls in, is puzzled by why she got charged a one-time fee of $49 for a wireless access point, it's Gen 1 equipment for wireless set-top boxes for Optic TV. She's even more puzzled, why would she have that charge when she doesn't have TV services from us? And I inform her she does, it started more or less a month ago. She's disputing that because Optic TV isn't available in her area. Now I'm confused. She lives in a small town and there's no optic TV there. I do a little digging and find out that someone, no ex-husband, was still on her account and got the three-year contract to get a free TV for optic TV and internet. She begins to cry on the phone and tells me her now ex-husband had an affair with a younger woman, divorced her, milked her for as much as he could and apparently still is milking her for more. He totally ghosted her. Moved to Alberta, changed his email and phone number, blocked her on all social media etc. In my mind, I'm like, what a dickhead. And I'm like, well I'm sorry if you cancel the services you're on the hook to pay for cancellation fees and so on. I can tell her though, I can remove his access to your account and you can also add on a password, downgrade the internet and TV to the bare essentials and I can attempt to redirect the TV gift from his address to hers but there's no guarantee as it's been processed already. I can hear the light going off in her head. Wait, what? You have where he's living now? Why, yes. He's got TV and internet services so there's a service address. She goes really quiet and says her lawyer and herself have been trying to track him down but his family and friends are being tight-lipped about it. She asks if I'm allowed to give that info to her. I smile and reply, this is your account. You have unrestricted access to service address, phone numbers, and emails that your now ex-husband provided to us to get hooked up. She asks that I can give her his new address, his new cell number, and the second number left on the account, presumably the new woman's, and contact info over the phone right now. I asked if she had a pen and paper handy. She was so ecstatic. And after giving her all the details from her account regarding the second service address, downgrade everything, and he was a hockey fan and there was a game playing right now with his team, so I wish I could have been a fly on the wall when the game cuts out and he calls in to ask WTF and discovers he's been removed, and there's an account pin and he's been discovered by his ex-wife and lawyer. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos.